The matter, space, and energy that comprise the universe is seen to be expanding outward. In the year 1929, astronomer Edwin Hubble measured the distance, speed, and direction of travel of the galaxies and found that they are all moving away from each other. This is what the universe is seen to be doing. It is an observational act. The galaxies are not expanding outward into previously existing empty space that had been sitting there waiting for their arrival, but instead space is expanding outward and taking the galaxies with it in a single existence. Going backward in time from today, we deduce that the galaxies had been closer together and that some 12 to 14 billion years ago, the matter, energy, and space comprising the universe was in a volume smaller than that of an atom. The space and matter had to be close enough together for subatomic forces to propel it outward in what has been called the Big Bang. There may be Big Bangs occurring within other bangs, like soap bubbles within interlaced soap bubbles. Albert Einstein explained that if all the mass of the universe was concentrated at a single point just before the instant of the Big Bang, then all the space was also concentrated at the same point because mass tells space how to curve and curved space tells matter how to move. Einstein also showed us that mass is another form of energy. About 10 to the 68 calories or joules of energy comprise the universe. The energy total does not change. It is the same today as it was at the moment of the Big Bang. Portions of energy change from one form to another. Some of that energy now comprises the atoms of your own body. The energy content of the atoms of your own body was there at the Big Bang. Astronomers measure the distance to nearby stars using triangulation. As the Earth makes its annual motion about the Sun, the closest stars are seen to shift slightly back and forth relative to the more distant stars. In another technique, astronomers measure the distance to stars in terms of their relative brightness because distant stars appear less bright. As Cepheid stars supply a standard brightness. Astronomers measure the speed of stars and galaxies using the Doppler effect. We are all familiar with this, the shift in tone from high to low as an ambulance or train passes by. In the case of light waves, we see a shift toward blue as a star approaches and a shift toward red as a star moves away. To make sense of the sequence of events in the aging universe, we first look at the changes in matter that occur as its temperature increases from very low to very high. For example, let's look at what happens on an atomic scale as ice is heated to water and then steam. We learn in grade school that water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen. Within a block of ice, each molecule jostles thermally back and forth while also being electrically held in place by its neighbors. As the block is heated, the molecules jostle and move more and more rapidly. At the melting temperature, the molecules are moving so rapidly that neighbors can no longer electrically hold each other in place. The block of ice melts, becoming water. A water molecule is no longer held in one place by its neighbors, but can roam around within the liquid pool that still holds it together somewhat. Upon further heating, water becomes steam. Steam is still nothing but water molecules, but each molecule is now moving so rapidly that it can freely disperse. Continue heating the steam, and its constituent hydrogen and oxygen atoms will break free of each other, becoming separate gases. Each atom consists of a nucleus of protons and neutrons, which are held together by the nuclear force. The nucleus is orbited by electrons held to the nucleus by the electrical attraction between electrons and protons. Heat yet further, and the protons and neutrons within the nucleus will separate. A proton is composed of three quarks. Scientists have measured the temperatures or thermal energies at which each of these changes occur. 
Subatomic energies are measured in particle accelerators, such as this one at CERN, in which large magnets force particles to move with increasing speeds in a circle that has a diameter of 9 kilometers. Accelerators attain energies as great as had occurred just 10 to the negative 43 seconds after the Big Bang. Scientists use particle accelerators to give a small amount of matter as much energy as it had at the very instant after the Big Bang. These measurements enable us to understand the evolution of the universe from that moment onward throughout its 13 billion year history. We do not yet know how the universe functions at energies higher than those measurable within today's particle accelerators. We heated that block of ice until it separated into its elementary particles. The reverse process also occurs. As elementary particles are cooled, they will merge into nuclei and then atoms and molecules. This occurs no matter the size of the material, even if it is as large as the universe. The total energy of the early universe was contained in a small volume at a very high temperature. As the volume expanded, the energy became less dense and so had a lower temperature. The elementary particles cooled and merged eventually forming lots of hydrogen atoms that gravity pulled into massive clumps to become stars. Gravity is the mutual attractive force between masses. As these two scientists pull inward on each other's arm, the mutual force causes them to orbit each other. Here the gravitational force is reaching out just like the skater's arms and causing these two galaxies to orbit each other. The red planet is orbiting the yellow star. The pink arrow shows the inward direction of the gravitational force of attraction that is pulling the red planet into orbit about the star. These three masses are attracting each other gravitationally. Gravity is an attractive force that causes pairs of masses to be pulled toward each other. Gravity caused the material of the early universe to coalesce into stars. It also causes today's clumps of interstellar gas and debris to mutually pull together into massive stars. This figure shows how material is gravitationally attracted toward its center. The large circle represents the Earth, and the circle on top represents a person standing on the Earth. The two smaller circles, shown on the left and right, represent equally sized pieces of uh, material that are below the surface of the Earth. The piece shown on the left is gravitationally pulling the person straight toward itself, as indicated by the black arrow on the left. The piece on the right is gravitationally pulling the person rightward and downward toward itself. Since each of these two pieces contain the same amount of material, they are gravitationally pulling the person with equal force. The leftward and rightward poles combine to pull the person straight toward the center of the Earth. If we divide all of the Earth's mass into pairs that are each placed symmetrically about the center, then we see that the net gravitational force is an attraction toward the center. This mutually inward gravitational force will cause the material forming a clump of interstellar gas to coalesce into a star. Within larger clumps, smaller clumps gravitate into planets that will orbit the star. Computer simulations show that it takes about a, a million years for gravitational interacting matter to accumulate into a central spherical mass. A new star is born when the accumulated weight of the outer portion of the star is great enough to crush together interior pairs of hydrogen atoms, fusing them into helium atoms and releasing energy. This fusion process releases tremendous amounts of energy in the form of heat and light. Fusion energy powers the sun. In turn, the energy from the sun drives the weather and powers all life on Earth. The newly formed star begins to emit light that pushes outward the remaining small dust particles and clears the solar system.
We have seen that just after the Big Bang, the early universe consisted of energetic elementary particles and light. As the universe expanded and cooled, protons, neutrons, and electrons formed and merged into hydrogen atoms and a small amount of helium atoms. Essentially, none of the other 100 types of atoms yet existed except for hydrogen and helium. The atomic elements that are heavier than hydrogen and helium, up through iron, are formed by fusion within stars. Fusion produces carbon, oxygen, iron, and other atoms within internal layers. Iron is the 26th element and is the largest atom formed by stellar fusion. Element numbers 27 through 92, which are cobalt through uranium, are formed only during supernova explosions. This means that the oxygen, iron, and copper atoms that comprise your own body were created within stars and supernova explosions. It is often said that you are made of star material. The supernova explosion ejects the stellar material and its atomic brew out into interstellar space as a thin and expanding spherical cloud of debris. The ring nebula is the remnant of a supernova explosion. Debris from exploded stars can gather in interstellar space as giant clouds of dust. Gravity will then regather this dust to form a second generation solar system that begins with oxygen and iron and such. The iron at the center of the earth is a remnant of previous stars. Life did not exist anywhere in the universe before stellar fusion had formed the carbon and other atoms that are needed for life. It is likely that life first occurs in second generation solar systems because they contain elements beyond hydrogen. The lifetime of a star ranges from 10 million to 10 billion years depending on the star's mass. The most massive stars burn brighter and have shorter lives. Our solar system formed from the debris of former stars and so had the benefit of beginning with carbon, oxygen, and iron and such rather than having only hydrogen and helium. The debris gravitated into one central sun, although many solar systems have two suns. Smaller clumps formed into the planets, including the Earth, and yet smaller clumps near the planet formed into some 200 moons. While it was accumulating material, the Earth grew in size. Within the Earth, the weight of the outer material crushed the central material and caused sufficient pressure to melt the core. The heaviest material then sank to the center, resulting in an iron core. The lighter material mostly floated to the top, forming the crust and continents. Released water formed the ocean. The crust and continents first solidified some 4.5 billion years ago. Remember that the Big Bang occurred some 12 billion years ago. The material of the Earth would have cooled off within 50 million years, but radioactive atoms within the Earth generate enough heat to keep it molten still today. The early atmosphere was mostly carbon dioxide. The analysis of earthquake waves tells us that the interior of the Earth consists of several concentric spherical shells and that the surface of the Earth is not formed of one solid piece of material. Instead, it is broken up into 30 sections in the manner of adjoining jigsaw pieces that geologists call tectonic plates. The continents ride along on top of the heavier crustal material in the same way that bread would float on oatmeal. Below the Earth's crust, some hotter sections of the mantle are moving upwards while adjacent sections are cooling and moving downwards. The convective movement of mantle pushes the plates and continents around the surface of the Earth. They move at a speed of about one inch or 2.5 centimeters per year. This is about the speed with which your fingernail grows. This movement and speed is easily measured by satellites. Sometimes a continent is sitting on top of two adjacent plates that begin to move apart 
due to an upwelling of mantle material. This causes that continent to become torn or split into two pieces, which then begin to move away from each other. An ocean may develop between those pieces. For example, about 200 million years ago, the South American and African continents were not separated by an ocean, but were adjacent to each other. Still today, the shapes of their coastlines are similar. The plates move so slowly that it has taken about 200 million years for the Atlantic Ocean to have its current width of 2,500 miles, or 4,000 kilometers. Plates often collide in a process that takes several million years and builds mountains. It then takes another 50 million years for the erosive effects of the wind, ice, and rain to wear down the mountain range. There have been many such cycles of mountain formation and erosion through the Earth's history. New mountains are rugged, tall, and steep like the Sierra Nevada, Andean, the European Alps, and Himalayan ranges, while old mountains have been worn down in size like the Australian Alps and the Appalachians. As the continents slowly move around the planet, their climate changes, and so do the plants and animals living on each continent. For example, as a continent moves from equatorial to polar locations, its tree cover changes in time from pine trees to palm trees. This history is determined from geological layers and radioactive data. Through the Earth's 4.5 billion year history, each continent has spent time submerged under oceans, has had sections uplifted into mountains, and has experienced climate ranging from glacial to desert and to rainforest. When most of the continents are located near the equator, then the seasonal variation in temperature is minimal, resulting in a year-round daily temperature of about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, or 21 degrees Celsius, throughout the planet and there are no glacial regions that are covered with year-round ice. We are said to be in an ice age whenever there are regions of year-round ice, such as today. Glaciation has retreated poleward from its last maximum that occurred 20,000 years ago. Notice that about 13,000 years ago, glacial retreat first allowed people to migrate overland from Asia to America. During a glacial maximum, or ice age, Summer temperatures are 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, or 5 to 10 degrees Celsius, colder than they are now. Through the last 2 million years, there have been about 20 cycles of glacial advance and retreat in which year-round ice has reached as far south as Kansas. These cycles are connected to the 100,000-year cycles in solar output and in the Milankovitch cycle that changes the Earth's orbit from more circular to more egg-shaped. At the same time, the tilt of the axis of the Earth varies from 21 to 24 degrees in a 41,000 year cycle, and its orbit precesses with a 23,000 year period. About 25% of the incoming solar energy evaporates water and causes the rain. Sunlight strikes perpendicularly to the ground at the equator. As shown on the left, but glances along the poles, making the equator hotter and causing wind and water currents to move. When continental positions allow ocean currents to flow from the equator toward the poles, the currents carry heat that warms the poles and keeps them free of glaciers. The ability of ocean currents to move equatorial heat poleward changes as the location and shape of the continents change through time. About 36 million years ago, the Antarctic continent moved to the southern pole, and a circumpolar oceanic current developed that conducts little equator to pole heat movement. The resulting glacier in Antarctica averages 6,500 feet or 2,000 meters in thickness and accounts for 90% of all glacial volume. Greenland's glacier accounts for another 9% of the total volume. The amount 
of sea ice occurring at the North Pole was indirectly enhanced by the joining of North and South America about three million years ago. This blocked an east-west flowing ocean current that was replaced by the Gulf Stream. It carries moisture-laden air northward, increases precipitation near the North Pole, and moderates European winters. When North and South America joined, ocean currents took some time to reset, and this may be what caused the climate in Africa to fluctuate so wildly that locations alternated between desert and deep lake in a series that repeated every thousand years or so. It's probably not a mere coincidence that this is the time at which the brain size of our ancestors doubled. The age of the glacial advances and retreats are determined in many ways. For one, as a glacier retreats, it exposes underlying rock to cosmic radiation. The radiation builds up through time and can be measured to deduce how much time has passed since the glacier retreated. Coral reefs always remain near the surface of the ocean, growing upwards and downwards as the level of the ocean changes. A history of their height reveals ocean levels and hence glacial volumes through time. Ocean levels and glacial volumes also give information about past temperatures, as do past longitudinal distributions of warm and cold water plankton. Geologists and paleontologists have pieced together a history of the Earth's past temperatures in many ways. Information is obtained from the types of plants and animals that are found in geologic layers because the temperature range of each species is known. Insects are especially useful in this way because each species lives in a particular limited temperature range. If a 10 million year old geological layer contains seeds from palm trees rather than pine trees, then we know something of that region's past climate. It is known that in tropical regions with high temperatures and high rainfall amounts, leaves are broad instead of narrow and have smooth instead of jagged edges. The ratio of broad to narrow and smooth to jagged edged leaves indicates past temperatures. There are a large number of factors affecting the amount of glaciation on the Earth's surface. Mile thick glaciers cannot accumulate on the ocean surface but can build on mountaintops. As the number of mountain ranges on the Earth varies through time, the total volume of water held in mountain glaciers also varies through time. Continental glaciers can occur whenever a continent is located at a pole, during a time of both cool temperatures and high precipitation at polar latitudes. Glacial buildup most rapidly occurs in the process of warm equatorial oceans with poleward currents. The continental positions, shapes, and groupings also determine if sea currents can carry warm water from the equator towards the pole. The amount of sunlight that reaches the ground to be absorbed by the Earth's surface depends on how much is reflected back into space. The reflected portion of solar energy depends on the distribution of land and sea by latitude, the percentage of ice-covered and cloud-covered land, the nature of the land surface, seas absorb sunlight while ice and desert reflect it, and the composition of volcanic dust held in the atmosphere. Through the last few centuries of industrialization, we humans have been altering the chemical composition of the atmosphere sufficiently to change its absorptive and reflective properties. Many man-made chemicals, from carbon dioxide to soot, are contributing to global warming. The two main factors that determine the temperature of the Earth are the heat output of the Sun, which satellite measurements have so far found to vary by 0.1%, and the heat holding properties of the Earth's atmosphere and oceans. If the Earth had no atmosphere and oceans, then its temperature would be just like that of the Moon, which has no atmosphere and oceans, and is the same distance from the Sun as is the Earth. Between day and night, the temperature of the moon swings through 500 degrees Fahrenheit or 300 degrees centigrade. 
The Earth's oceans and atmosphere hold heat so that the Earth's temperature swing is just 30 degrees. The Earth's atmosphere is 30 miles or 50 kilometers tall. Its temperature is minus 300 at the top and 40 at the bottom where we live. Even on a hot summer day, the temperature there is 0 degrees, just 1600 yards or meters above the ground. Our lives depend on the temperature of the lowest 1600 yards or meters of air because that is where we live. We risk global death by altering this temperature with air pollution. Each coal-fired electrical generating plant burns 200 to 500 train car loads of coal every day and we have some 50,000 of these plants. They emit half of the greenhouse gases created by our civilization. They emit more radiation than a nuclear powered plant. They emit the mercury that is in our waters and food supply and their emissions cause lung disease. The leaders of this industry are the only people in the world who want these things. Starting in 1980, we should have installed equipment on every building throughout the planet to harness solar and wind energy. Denmark is preparing to harness wind energy to power electrical cars for everyone. The temperature of the Earth's atmosphere depends on its chemical composition because that determines its ability to hold heat. Our factories, electrical generating plants, and cars have been changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere. This may be causing it to retain more heat and become hotter. The world's scientists and engineers would be thrilled to design homes, cars, and factories that emit nothing into the environment. In that way, we will no longer be gambling with our future. Much of the workings of nature involves the flow of energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It is only changed from one form to another. For example, a tiny portion of the energy of the Big Bang is stored in the mass of the sun. The Earth receives a portion of the sun's energy in the form of heat and sunlight that was emitted during nuclear fusion. Some 1400 watts of solar energy hit the Earth's outer atmosphere. About one quarter of one hundredth of this energy is absorbed by plants during photosynthesis and is stored as chemical energy within those plants. This tiny portion of the sun's energy powers all life on Earth. About 10% of the energy consumed by plants is consumed by the animals that eat the plants. And about 10% of this energy is consumed by the animals that eat the animals that eat the plants. Eating a spoonful of peas will give you enough mechanical energy to run for 30 seconds and then climb up a flight of stairs. This heats you and in turn heats the surrounding air. The heat energy then radiates back into outer space. A fundamental force of nature is the electrical force between charges. Remember that there are two types of charges, called positive and negative, and that like charges repel, but unlike charges attract. The flow of charge is seen in electricity within wires and in lightning. An atom consists of negatively charged electrons that orbit a nucleus of positively charged protons and uncharged neutrons. The electrical force makes electrons orbit the nucleus in the same way that gravity makes the Earth orbit the Sun, and the way that holding hands made the two skaters orbit each other due to the force they exert on each other by holding hands. There are about 100 different types of atoms. They differ in that hydrogen always has one proton in its nucleus, helium always has two, carbon has six, oxygen eight and uranium has 92. There is a range in the number of neutrons within each type of atom. These are isotopes, many of which emit radiation. Of all the atoms within a person, about two-thirds are oxygen and one-fourth are carbon. 
By the way, an atom typically stays in your body for about 18 months before being replaced by another identical atom while your whole body remains the same. It is mathematically possible to form zillions of combinations of these 100 atoms by taking them two at a time, three at a time, and such, or by combining one of each, two of each, and so on. The grand total is equal to the number of combinations of 100 things taken up 100 at a time. Out of the zillions of combinations, a smaller number are actually able to form into what are then called molecules. These combinations of atoms that are electrically able to hold together do. Those that electrically repel do not form into a molecule. The simplest combination involves a large number of single types of atom. Iron, for example, without mixing in any other types of atoms. The result is usually a cube-shaped block that can be large enough to hold in your hand. Each iron atom is electrically held in place by its neighbors. The electrical forces are represented here as springs holding neighbors in place. Regularly spliced blocks of atoms are the typical result of combining large numbers of single types of atom. These are hydrogen and oxygen atoms that have formed a block of ice. We saw earlier that atoms jiggle in place more rapidly as the block is heated. When it is sufficiently hot and the motion is large enough, then the neighbors can no longer hold each other in place. The electrical springs break and the atoms move apart. Carbon atoms are special in that they form rings rather than cubically shaped blocks, and rings of rings can be formed to in those shapes. This carbon ring is a benzene molecule. Additional rings can be attached to the spokes. A long, one-dimensional line of rings can be folded into a repeating, into a repeating S shape that is two-dimensional, as done with the rubber band shown here. The sheets can be folded over into complicated shapes, such as the phenylalanine hydroxylase seen in the upper right. The entire molecule consists of equal numbers of positive and negative charges, and so it is electrically neutral, but some of its sides have a non-zero electrical charge. For copies of this molecule will electrically hold on to each other when their sides are oriented in the manner shown. The electrical forces between the components of any organic molecule cause the folding and crumpling of the structure. If nearby portions electrically repel, then they will not join. If they electrically attract, then they will join. Indeed, they must. In the end, each specific molecule always takes the same shape, and this shape is electrically determined. Here are tyrosine and alanine molecules. There are two of the 20 amino acids that occur in all the Earth's living creatures. Amino acids are combined to form larger molecules that are proteins, enzymes, and hormones. Proteins are combined to make the tissues and organs comprising a living creature. Some proteins include hair, nails, muscle, and spider webs. The adrenaline molecule is involved in the bust of energy that occurs in special situations. Dopamine is a chemical that occurs in our brain when we experience pleasure. Oxytocin occurs in our brain when we are falling in love. In the seconds after childbirth, a flood of oxytocin bonds parents and offspring for life. This occurs in all mammal species. Much biology involves the chemistry of carbon. Carbon rings combine into endless shapes. When you start with one carbon ring and add an atom to its end every year for a billion years, then you will have a billion atom molecules such as the DNA molecule. Much of it consists of the four molecules that we will refer to as A, C, G, and T molecules. A and T molecules will electrically hold on to each other, as do G and C. Other pairings repel each other. D 
DNA has the shape of a helix or a twisted ladder whose rungs consist of either a GC or AT pairings of molecules. The latter sides are like mirror images of each other. A certain molecule causes the DNA ladder to split down the middle. Since the DNA halves are immersed in a soup of A, C, G, T, and other molecules, each half of the ladder will electrically attract its mirror image. The DNA molecule has been replicated. Replication is one of the special properties of DNA. DNA also builds and operates an individual creature, be it bacteria, mouse, or person. Along the latter rung, each series of three A, C, G, or T molecules electrically directs the formation of one of the 20 amino acids that are combined into the hormones and proteins that are used in the construction and operation of our bodies. For example, the triplet sequence AGC followed by AAT will cause tyrosine and alanine molecules to be formed out of the surrounding mix of chemicals and then joined together. This video shows a protein being formed in the long line that will next be folded and crumpled as we saw earlier. The DNA molecule also contains a chemical construction map used to produce the sequence of chemicals needed to grow an entire individual, from seed to adult, from absorbed and ingested chemicals. For example, if you feed milk to your newborn infant, then his or her DNA will electrically direct the conversion of the chemicals in milk to the chemicals comprising your baby. DNA builds the protein cells, tissues, and organs, including the heart, lungs, brain, bones, arms, and legs. In response to specific situations, DNA also builds adrenaline, oxytocin, and other chemicals associated with each of our emotions. Our emotions are just as much a part of us as are our lovers. Within the body, each specific chemical imbalance causes DNA to produce a chemical response to restore the balance. In this way, DNA directs the operation of the individual. When chemicals A and B are placed in a container, the mix will always result in the same final chemicals, say C and D. These chemical reactions will always occur and will always produce the same end result. If you place a rose seed in contact with the chemicals of the dirt and air, then the DNA of the rose will produce a series of proteins that grow an entire plant. This series of chemical reactions will always occur. The DNA molecule electrically generates the sequence of chemical proteins that combine into tissues and organs to grow an entire human being from seed to adult. Flowers are actually brightest in ultraviolet colors because that is the color that bees are most sensitive to. The flower does not see it, but it has evolved to take advantage of light. A plant would consider vision to be an extrasensory perception. If you take away your senses of sight, hearing, smell, and taste, then you would be a plant. These senses form a large part of the human animal. It's hard to imagine a brand new sense for ourselves, but it's easy to imagine taking them away. In review, most of the 100 types of atoms combine to form only cubicle structures, but carbon forms into rings of rings that make up sheets and crumpled proteins that have biological functions and result in creatures that ponder themselves. As Rebecca puts it, one difference between living and non-living matter is just a simple divergence of atomic structure. DNA is a special molecule that electrically binds and operates individual creatures and is self-replicating. Evolution consists of the changes that occur between successive generations. Once the first self-duplicating molecule developed on the Earth, it would naturally occur that any change making that molecule better able to make duplicates would result in increased numbers of that molecule. Evolution began with the first 
self-duplicating molecule. Life consists of the chemistry of these self-duplicating, self-directing, self-growing, electrically interacting molecules. We have seen that the electrical force binds atoms and molecules into those structures that are able to form. Since most of these collections of molecules from rocks and such, we see that we are a lucky bunch of atoms. From head to toe and back to skin, a human has a couple dozen organs, a couple hundred bones, and about 500 body components including muscles and such, and 11 organ systems. These are the circulatory, nervous, muscular, skeletal, reproductive, which has two varieties, urinary, digestive, respiratory, lymphatic, cardiovascular, and endocrine systems. Each organ within our body contains cells organized into the four types of tissues known as epithelial, connective, nerve, and muscle tissues. Epithelial tissue forms a lining around organs and also forms skin. Connective tissue includes ligaments, tendons, cartilage, bone, blood, and the fibers of organ walls. This tissue connects, supports, and protects other tissues. Nerve tissue forms brains, transmits signals to muscles, senses heat and other exterior conditions. Muscle tissue includes the four varieties that continually move and support our bodies. Flex when signal to move particular bones, continually beat hearts, and the smooth variety that contracts on its own to move the internal fluids of bladders, the lung bronchi, and the walls of blood vessels. Blood and nerve signals flow within every organ. The organ system composing our own bodies have accumulated through the sequence of stepping stone animal forms that have developed in the last 750 million years, including non-boned invertebrates with eyes and a sense of touch, fish with bony skeletons and hearts and brains amphibians that left the ocean for land, reptiles that laid hard-shelled eggs, parenting mammals, and social primates. We humans share organ systems, skeletal structures, and senses with all of these other animal species. The vast majority of our genes produce our bodies, with cells, arms, legs, eyes, hearts, livers, and other organs. Every animal species retains or inherits its DNA from ancestral species. The same genes produce eyes in either a fly or mouse. Additional genes make the eye of a mouse different than the eye of a fly. Your own DNA, and that of every other species on Earth, is a direct descendant of the first self-duplicating molecule that developed some 4 billion years ago. It is often mentioned that humans and chimpanzees share 98% of their genes It is also true that humans and mice share 85% of their genes because most of these genes are used to make lungs and livers and arms and legs and such. In the figure, we see that less than 1% of the genes of a mouse occur only in mice. 14% of its genes are in common with other mammals. 6% is shared with other backbone animals. 27% with other multicellular creatures. 29% is shared with the eukaryotes, which are single-celled creatures having a nucleus. And 23% are shared with prokaryotes, whose cells have no nucleus. This means that about half of our genes produce cells and about half produce its arms and legs and livers and such. 
Two human beings share 99.9% of their genes, and so are only 0.1% genetically different. This is true whether or not those two individuals come from the same hometown or come from opposite sides of the earth, and whether or not they are of the same race. Two siblings differ by half of that 0.1%. This also means that a stranger from the other side of the planet is only twice as different from you as is your sibling. And, gathering five persons from throughout the planet produces no more variety than gathering five siblings. We next look at the sequence of species that have occurred on the Earth. Life remained single cellular until about 750 million years ago. Paleontologists have found millions of fossilized animal remains. As I first started finding fossils a couple hundred years ago, Scientists constantly found new fossil species that had never before been seen. Eventually, new excavations resulted only in additional copies of already known fossil species. As they stopped encountering previously unknown fossil species, they knew that they were beginning to have a fairly complete picture of the past. In the last few centuries, thousands of biologists have spent their entire lifetime studying millions of living and fossilized plant and animal species. C.C. Starr explains that sponges are ancient and very successful, though they have no organs and no body symmetry. This microscopic mytelina feeds as it uses its appendage to push itself around. Jellyfish are a primitive species that does not have a brain or a central nervous system, but does have a network of nerves that react to touch. It does not have eyes, but some types do have a light-sensitive organ that can detect only brightness or darkness. Soft-bodied mollusks such as clams occur when a shell is secreted from the body. Bivalves do not have a head and are filter feeders. Flatworms have a three-layer tissue that gave rise to muscle tissue and descendant species. Roundworms have a complete digestive system. Highly specialized nerve and sensory systems first appear in the arthropoda animals which include insects, spiders, crabs, and lobsters, and such. Insect segmentation favors the evolution of specialized head parts, legs, wings, and other appendages. Tunicates, larvae, have a flexible notochord that is bent one way and then the other as muscles are flexed. This flexing propels it forward in a way that might resemble that of the ancestors of fish. Adult tunicate attach themselves to the substrate. This alga may be the ancestor of the first backbone animals. A filter feeder that is permanently attached to the ground must wait for food to pass by. An animal that instead moves can go in search of food. This opens up endless new possibilities. This Aaron Daspis is a filter feeding jawless fish that began to occur almost 500 million years ago. This lamprey is a modern jawless fish.
An early form of backbone vertebrates had a hollow central nervous system, gill slits, tail, and a circulatory system with a pumping heart. This is the reason that you have a backbone and a heart. This fish led to all the vertebrates that live in the water and on the land. The gill slits were mainly for filter feeding but also helped obtain oxygen. These first fish appeared about 500 million years ago. Fish have a rudimentary brain formed from a clump of nerves. This is the reason that you have a brain. The earliest fish had no jaw but soon some of its gills developed into a jaw and a gill arch support developed into an ear. They also have a movable tongue. These modern fish are walking catfish that are found in Florida and Indonesia. They can move short distances on land. A few hundred million years ago, the first fish to leave the water likely did so to avoid predators or to move between receding puddles. This is a photo of an Ichiostega. Since these ancestral animals have four limbs, you do also. Amphibians such as salamanders, frogs, and toads evolved from fish and so are the link between fish and reptiles. It took some 15 million years for amphibians to develop. A number of changes occur as animals adapt from life in the water to life on the land because the two environments are very different. For example, an animal's body can dry up when it is no longer surrounded by water. Also, since the buoyancy of the water is no longer supporting the animal's weight, more supporting bones are needed and an increased metabolism will be needed to provide the increased energy requirement that this entails. As plant-eating animals migrate from water onto land, they find that their food is very different and this requires changes in its digestive system. There is a much wider range between day and nighttime temperatures on land than occurs in the water. The change in environment required many changes in the body, including the enlargement of lungs and the replacement of gills. Nasal passages became enlarged for better breathing and a better heart, having three chambers emerge for increased circulation. Eyes were no longer immersed in water, so they developed eyelids, glands, and lubrication ducts, all of which keep eyes free of foreign objects and protect them from the glare of the sun. There was pectoral and pelvic strengthening to support the increased body weight and a strengthened attachment of the internal bones that support limbs. Amphibians lay fish-style eggs in water and their young begin life with gills. A neck developed to allow the independent movement of the skull. The spinal column became sturdy but flexible. Soon, some land-based reptiles moved back into the sea, looking much like the later mammals who moved back into the sea to develop into whales and dolphins and such. Reptiles developed from amphibians. Dinosaurs are reptiles, as are snakes and lizards. While amphibians lay soft eggs in water, reptiles lay hard-shelled eggs on land. The egg of a reptile contains its own pond. The egg contains food for the growing creature and its soft shell allows air to flow in and carbon dioxide to flow out. A reptile's legs are on the side of their body so that they walk by twisting left and right, swinging their legs outward like oars. In contrast, the legs of a mammal are underneath their bodies, allowing for better support and movement. Both birds and mammals are descendants of the reptiles. A little while after the dinosaurs became extinct, mammals increased in abundance by outcompeting the remaining reptiles. 
They did this by acquiring an improved nervous system and increased speed and agility. The first mammals ate insects, as do today's shrews and moles. We humans are still able to digest insects, though many cultures prefer not to. Except for birds and insects, the animals that we most often see every day are mammals. Every four-legged furry animal is a mammal, as are we humans. Mammals differ from reptiles in a number of important ways. Mammals have hair and sweat glands for body temperature control, and a larger portion of their body weight is due to their brains. Instead of laying eggs, mammals internally incubate their young and then give birth to live young. Mammals have mammary glands for feeding their young, and most importantly, they have a parenting reproductive strategy in which they take more personal care of their young than do egg-laying reptiles. This strategy is in contrast to most non-mammals who are not parents in that adults typically leave behind a batch of thousands of eggs to tend for themselves. The adult never knows its offspring and just a small portion of those thousands of abandoned offspring survive to become adults themselves. Since this attention makes their young more likely to live beyond childhood, mammalian litters contain fewer individuals than do those of non-parenting species. The lack of parenthood among other animals will also mean they have a lack of parenthood instincts. These parents worry only about their own lives. Mammals have a child rearing strategy in which they protect, teach, and rear their offspring through infancy until they in turn become old enough to have their own children. We have seen that natural selection means that those individuals whose traits are better matched to their environment of climate predators and food will be more likely to live long enough to have offspring. For mammals, the most genetically fit individuals are those who are matched to their environment and successfully rear their children to the point that they in turn are prepared to raise their own children. Mammalian parenthood is a large part of the human animal. Mammals are also much better at communicating than are reptiles. And they make it obvious to each other that they are friendly, are going to attack or that they are happy, sad, or angry. I can understand the face and posture of a growling dog, but communicate little with insects or reptiles. Parental care consists of cleaning and grooming, transporting, retrieving, feeding, defending, babysitting, and teaching. Offspring are taught by example. They watch their mother to learn everything needed in life, including which foods to eat, how to make nests, and the details of interspecies behaviors. We humans learn most effortlessly simply by watching and then doing. This practice is older than language and it is how we acquire our culture. General mammalian behaviors include feeding, play, communication, relations with others of the same group and with other groups of the same species, defense against predators, dealing with the climate, reproduction, and child rearing and training. For the last 50 million years, these have been the daily activities of our direct mammalian ancestors, as they are for us human beings still today. Mammals communicate specific emotional states in various ways, including sight, sound, and touch. Bonding occurs during the touches of grooming and affection. A firm bite gives a warning. Odor indicates membership in a group and individuals rank within the group. Territorial boundaries or indicates estrus, which is the time at which a female can conceive. For most mammal species, estrus occurs during only a handful of days per year, but reproduction-related activities often play a large role throughout the year. Each mammal species uses specific body postures to communicate affection and anger alertness, the threat of aggression, the intent to defend, submission, play in courtship. You have likely seen each of these displays in cats and dogs as well as in humans. Courtship displays can include both sight and touch. 
These displays must be long enough to display fitness, but short enough to be completed before predators arrive. Birds are able to have long and complicated courtship displays because they can more easily flee. Birds tend to develop bright colors to attract mates, but mammals have a tendency to develop colors that provide camouflage from predators or prey. Mammals produce sounds of varying pitch and loudness to warn group members of approaching predators or to give a threat to another member of the group. Wolves who live in small groups make sounds to bring together the group members and to warn away other groups while coyotes, who mostly live as lone hunters, howl to indicate their territory in order to keep all other coyotes away. Communicating with sound is an option when the sound will not attract predators. Birds and monkeys in the trees are noisy because they can easily flee. Rabbits make very little sound. A small number of mammalian species sing to keep in contact with other group members and to attract mates. Whales make a repetitive song having a 30 minute duration. A whale changes its song through the years by changing or adding notes. Some primate species sing to other group members scattered around the forest. We humans sometimes sing while working or playing in groups and sometimes attract mates by singing. We distinguish happy from sad music. Some Parkinson's patients suddenly begin to dance while listening to a song that had been their favorite before the disease began. Individuals vary in height and resistance to specific diseases and such. Variations in the genetic makeup of the individuals of a species occur and are tested for usefulness by the environment of climate, predators, and prey. The environment does not produce these changes. It only tests the usefulness of the existing variations and the characteristics of the individuals of the species. The useful traits continue to get passed on to future generations simply because future generations are then able to occur, and this results in a shift in the average characteristics of that species. After several such adjustments, the species will have changed significantly. It will have evolved. Whenever you hear the word evolution, you should think of changes in the most appropriate traits due to changes in the environment of climate, predators, and food. Evolution is about becoming better matched to the environment and is not about becoming more complicated. It is not about the survival of the strongest. Behavioral and emotional traits are also passed on to successive generations and are subject to the same rules of evolution by natural selection. We human beings are parenting mammals. In fact, we live for our children. We first of all strive for happy and healthy children, families, and communities. If you ask 10,000 persons from 10,000 different cultures around the world, they would all tell you that they agree that we live for our children. Parenting behavior developed concurrently with parenting emotions. It's not the case that mammals acted as parents for thousands of generations, and then later, parenting emotions of love were added. Both parenting behavior and parenting love develop simultaneously. All mammals are parents, but it is the case that only about 5% of mammalian species form monogamous parenting relationships. For each mammalian species, the social size is determined by the available food packet size. There are three general approaches to finding food. First, 
If the food of a species is found in widely scattered places and occurs in such small quantities that only a single individual can make a meal of it, then that species often consists of lone hunters, such as coyotes or house cats. Second, if food sources are widely scattered but occur in group-sized bundles, then the members of that species typically forage as a group and then share the food when it is found. This is the approach typically adopted by us primates. The third case occurs when food is so abundant that it is within each member's constant reach. It then plays a smaller role in their behavioral interactions, as happens for the grazing mammals such as gazelles and horses. Most commonly, the members of species live in social groups where access to food and mates is determined by a dominance hierarchy. The most dominant is the alpha male of the group. These elephants are forming a protective circle around their young. There are benefits to being a member of a group. For example, all members can watch for predators and alert the others to their presence. This is a mutually beneficial exchange of assistance. At the same time, the group members must compete over any limited resources of food and mates. Fighting is limited by the dominance hierarchy. This means that within the group, each pair of individuals will come to a mutual agreement about who will have priority access to food and potential mates and such. This agreement begins during their adolescent encounters and continues to mature as they mature. From then on, when that pair of individuals approaches an item of mutual interest, the higher ranking individual takes the item and the other moves on. If each encounter instead resulted in a fight to the death, then pretty soon there would be no members left and the species would disappear from the earth. When the members of a species do not fight to the death, then those members are more likely to live long enough to have children. In a group of, say, 100 individuals, we might number those individuals from 1 to 100 according to their position in the hierarchy. This group also consists of several families. The most dominant individual might be a member of family A, while the next three most dominant individuals might be members of families B, C, and D. The group members interact as pairs of individuals. Primates differ from the other mammals in that they form more complex social systems that are based on the extended family. Rather than a dominance hierarchy of individuals, primate society consists of a dominance hierarchy of extended families. Within a group of primates, each individual recognizes the other members of its extended family and the entire extended family cooperates as a unit. In addition, each primate individual knows who comprises the extended family of every other individual. We recognize and assist first our brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins, and grandparents. Our family relations form a large part of what it is to be a human. Primate individuals know the members of their extended family. Other mammals do not. Primate social systems are the most complex because there is extensive cooperation among related individuals. In a primate social system, the group is not led by a single individual, the pack leader, at the top of the hierarchy, but is instead led by the members of the dominant extended family. This means that the members of one family are dominant to the members of all other families. Even adults back down to youngsters of the dominant family. Through the years, this dominance will shift from one family to another, depending on the number of individuals at the height of their health and reproductive years. There is a mutually beneficial exchange of assistance among the members of the extended family in obtaining access to food and such. You have special feelings for your aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, and siblings. 
You will do more for them, and they will do more for you. The extended family forms a large part of human nature. Recognizing the individuals of a group and knowing who is related to whom and who will come to the assistance of whom promotes bigger brains, sympathy, empathy, and self-awareness. Complex social systems promote the evolution of bigger brains. For us humans today, to know a person is to be able to predict his or her behavior in various situations. We are naturally adept at doing this. It is something we do effortlessly because our brains have evolved to perform this specific task. For a few million of years, our hominid ancestors have lived in groups of 50 or so individuals. This is the reason that our brains have the capacity to know well that number of persons. Our brains are made for social reasoning. For example, we might figure out that Kyle is trying to get Brian to interfere in the relationship between Isabella and Jake because his third cousin's ex-roommate, Carrie, thinks April should get even with Jake for yelling at Jeff, who is her friend. It is not as effortless for us to do arithmetic, like dividing the number 22 by 7. We can believe that the brain of this primate is a bit different than the brain of a gazelle that has only to walk along flat ground. These macaque monkeys are our primate cousins. Just as did our mutual ancestors several million years ago, they form a mutually beneficial social group to better accomplish any task that is larger than a single individual can do alone. The earliest tasks are to watch for predators, warn others, and to look for food. Since food is found in group sized bundles, it is best for a group to search for it together and then share it when it is found. This also means that the lives of our newly social ancestors literally depended on the community's continued existence. They developed social behaviors that kept it functioning in order to secure its continued existence, and hence, their own. Social individuals understand that their own behavior is not good for themselves if it damages the community because there would then be no community. They would again be going in alone and find themselves less likely to survive. Our notions of right and wrong stems from our innate understanding that something isn't good for me if it is not good for another member of my community. A few million years ago, social systems and social behaviors developed simultaneously. It is not the case that we lived in a social group for hundreds of generations and then added a golden rule at a later time. The golden rule is innate to the social species. The social rule and the social system are one and the same. We all agree about the proper behavior between the family, friends, and neighbors forming our society. This proper behavior is often described as the predisposition to do as the other did, to expect the other to do what you did. This agreement is synonymous with our primate social system because it is the social glue that creates this system. With each generation, it creates a new the social group. We expect our society to be mutually beneficial for all of us. We react to anything less as an injustice. We expect this of every interaction within our community. Our governments legally define this notion, and our religions remind us that it is the most important aspect of our mutual lives. Society develops simultaneously with our golden rule. Whenever we have a feeling that we are doing something wrong, our actions are involving other persons.
we have an innate feeling that it isn't right for me if it's wrong for someone else. This feeling is exactly as old as the first social system. Today, those of us who are Christians say, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Those of us who are Buddhists say, Treat everyone as if they are you, and that the group is important, not one individual. Islam teaches one to love for your brother what you would love for yourself. And Confucianists say, before you act, you should apply the personal test. How would you feel yourself? You can find the answer in yourself. If you asked all 7 billion of us to state our guiding social principle, we would simultaneously answer the golden rule. No matter which religion a person follows, or even if a person chooses not to follow any particular religion, this rule has been innate to our species for a few million years. We would not otherwise be a social group. We form a community or society because of the unspoken certainty we have that the mutually beneficial exchange of help makes for a better life than going it alone. It is unspoken because it is innate. We don't have to think about it first and then decide to be a member of society. This is what we do naturally. You can choose to be a hermit on a mountain, but you do not have to choose to live in a group of people. Still today, we innately exchange assistance in any task that is larger than could be handled by one individual. If we see that a task requires the combined efforts of several persons, then we combine efforts and expect continued exchanges. We are adept at determining which chores are large. In forming societies, the village members typically get together to harvest a crop field on the single best day that it should be harvested. This often takes the entire village. In 18th century New England, community members got together to peel apples or corn. This is what our grandparents did. Do you believe that when our village farmers exchange harvesting assistance, they are doing the exact same thing as when our social primate ancestors exchange assistance in looking for food and watching for predators? Both occur because of our innate golden social rule. There is not much to a person besides love and family, community and justice. In a single sentence, those four things describe a human and the nature of a human. It is no accident that these are the topics of most every conversation and work of art. Our arts express and communicate these cares and emotions. Our religions emphasize the most important aspects of our lives and of our society. Each of us feels that these are the four largest concerns in life. You know that every person on the planet feels the same way as you because we all share a common humanness. These few things comprise human existence, explain the world of us humans and our myriad of activities, and are the natural priorities for the mutual efforts that are our worldwide society and civilization. But we've gotten ahead of ourselves. Let's look at the transition from mammal to primate to human. Scientists have cataloged some 4,000 species of mammals, 9,000 species of birds, and about 1 million insect species. Altogether, more than 1.5 million animal species have been studied. But this is only a fraction of the estimated 10 million species that exist on the planet. And for each species that exists today, about a hundred have come and gone in the past. Scientists determine the time at which each fossil species appears and then later disappears. This reveals the time sequence of changes in plants and animal species. Each fossil skeleton is like a snapshot of the development of a species. A series of snapshots forms a movie. The observed time sequence of small changes that have occurred for each species shows that they are evolving in time. 
changes in species occurs through changes in genetic mutations or in response to changes in predators, food, or climate. A species typically exists for a few million years before becoming extinct, but some species last 100 times that long. Through the 750 million years that have elapsed since multicellular life first appeared, about 200 species size changes have had time to occur and to evolve bacteria into people.